and this is Gwen. Hey guys. We are the experimental expediters. We are on permanent vacation, a working vacation. We left our jobs, our corporate jobs, with secure incomes, daily, uh, weekly paychecks. Nine to five. Nine to five. <laughs> know what to expect every day and kind of got bored of it. And we are on a paid vacation. It's been seven and a half months of fun, excitement. We've seen the whole country, Canada, Montreal, Toronto. And we are going to talk to you guys about it, how you might be able to do this as well. And you can join us for the adventure, the experimental expediters, right after this. looking at feeding the seagulls, birds at the park with a lot of people around, going to Hershey Park, places like Disney. Uh, it's on hold for a little while. Things things are a little difficult right now. Uh, if you look behind me over my shoulder, hand sanitizer. Uh, the coronavirus has taken over. It's temporary. Um, as, as expediters, we are in need more than ever. We're still, life goes on. We just have to take extra care to stay healthy so that we can do what we do. Um, but some of the things that go with our experience around hold a little bit. Um, so it's different out there. For example, driving through Chicago with the speed limit. I've never done that before. Uh, that says what's going on. Very, very different and eerie. Uh, a lot of you at home watching may be home because of the virus. And we just need to use common sense, whether you're driving out in, as, a, in a, as a truck driver or you're home, you've got to do everything you can to keep your immunity up. Drink uh, orange juice, drink anything that has vitamin C, take zinc. Uh, chicken soup has zinc in it and other good things. That's not a bad thing. Keep your immunity up, sleep well, get your rest. Um, that's really important. If you do contract the virus, you'll be able to fight it a little better. So common sense, washing your hands, all these things we hear on the news, I don't need to tell you. Uh, but we're out in the world uh, with this because um, we have to continue to bring pharmaceuticals and chemicals and government produced items, many of which are used to, to assist in fighting the virus or caring for patients. We have to still be out there to do that, so we have to make sure we stay healthy uh, and able to continue to do our jobs. So our, our world hasn't stopped, but we're not going to the parks and feeding the birds, and we're not doing things we used to enjoy. Uh, we're staying inside our truck more. We're preparing meals in our truck more. Uh, we're, we're doing pretty much everything we can uh, to stay healthy. Now, we just took a huge risk um, this week being first week of April, 
uh, we actually went home because we had our granddaughter's birthday, first birthday party. So that was important. We had to make sure for several days that we were healthy enough to go home and not introduce anything we may have gotten, don't even know we have, into the family. And there's risk. We don't know. The testing isn't there. We could have. We don't know. Um, but hopefully we haven't. We're all, we're all okay. So everyone just has to constantly use common sense, whether you're going to uh, be in contact with someone when you don't know you could have had it for two weeks. And a few days from now, you'll find out, oh, you're having symptoms. You could have just given it to people that you were with the last few days. So everyone, including us, has to take change, make changes in how we do things. When I get a document signed, I'm not handing them my pen and I'm not using their pen. Um, I'm not handing them my clipboard. Things like that. It's got to be a little bit different. Um, there might be places I go to where they do not accept me to enter their facility, and I have to understand that. Um, I may not be going into the building to load and secure my freight. They're going to be doing some places where we're doing that themselves. A lot of things are changing because of this. Uh, I showed you some of the flyers from the truck stops. Things are changed there. Um, what's not changed is the need for us to do our job. And if you're interested in becoming an expediter, some of you are on hold at work. Um, I was at Disney. A lot of those people are home and they're being paid less than they would have possibly if they worked more hours, etc. Um, but life's going on for us as long as we stay healthy. If you're interested in being an expert, I have a video talking about some of the decision-making process, some of the things to think about, what's entailed. Uh, and I, I haven't made that video earlier. I'm still going to present it to you. Um, so take a look at this. experimental expediters. Lynn is in the sleeper right now as required by DOT as we share the driving uh, experience here. So my last video was pretty much just an intro. I talked about this being a working vacation, a uh, paid vacation, but it is a job and while I do enjoy the job I have to concentrate on keeping things safe. I have to concentrate on making sure I get things to the customers safely and undamaged and on time. So there's a lot of responsibility involved. As an expediter, especially with FedEx, Custom Critical, White Glove Division, what we're carrying is usually very critical, very valuable. It could be pharmaceuticals, it could be raw materials for pharmaceuticals, it could be government shipments, including a part of a satellite, or an entire satellite. It could actually be explosives for the military. It could be zoo animals, or fine art being transported to places like the Sotheby Auction House, which we've done. So except for the live animals, we've done all the things I've talked about, as well as uh, uh, there's radioactive uh, materials that are carried as well. So, it does require someone with a strong background, criminal-free background. U.S. citizens are preferred because of some of the uh, government shipments, they require that. So, as long as you have a good, solid background, okay, so you're, you're in the running. So, they're going to talk a little bit about the decision process of, are you someone who is suitable for this? So, let's talk about a few of the things. So, one of them is you're going to be away from home for long periods of time. If that's an issue for you, sit back, enjoy our videos, and you can see what it's like to be an expediter from your home seat, on the couch, wherever you might be. Because we are away from home maybe two months at a time. It could be four weeks, it could be one week. If I happen to get a run to my hometown, I'll go there, stay overnight, and leave. Uh, scheduled home visits, usually I get about a day for every week I'm out. So if I'm out a month or so, I'll have four or five days in home. So that's how it works. If you're home, you don't make money. It's your own business. So when you're out, that's when you make the money. So if being away from home long periods of time is an issue for you, you may want to rethink that. In my opinion, this truck that I'm driving right now is my home, even though I do I have a, a regular home. It's got everything I need. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing, are you able to drive long periods of time? Because, just to give you an example, certain pickups we do require you to drive for 200 continuous miles without stopping for security reasons. So that could be three to four hours, depending on traffic. Uh, so you need to be able to do that. 
sometimes you're driving 10 or 11 hours a day, uh, and you have to have a partner. That's something else we'll talk about as well. So I didn't mention, do you have a commercial driver's license? To be an expediter, they want you to have a license for at least one year, one year's experience. Have a safe driving record, the clean background I talked about. But what if you don't have that license? You can get it, and you can get a year's experience. I'll tell you how I got mine. I never drove a truck in my life until I came here. But I drove buses for Walt Disney World in Orlando, Florida. I never drove a bus when I went there. They taught me in two weeks how to drive a bus. I got my license to drive a bus in two weeks. They paid me while I was learning. I got my Disney tickets, got to go in all the parks as much as I want, get discounts at the restaurants and things. And a lot of other perks, including fantastic health insurance. So I'm not doing a commercial for Disney, but a lot of people do find jobs that have uh, paid training to get their commercial driver's license. That way you don't have to go to a school and pay, pay the school to teach you. So those people that go to Disney and get paid, there's no contract right now. Uh, you can get your license and leave. But we want a year's experience so you can stay at Disney a year and enjoy the parks and all the perks that come with it. Once you've done that, you're a suitable candidate for being an expediter. So FedEx isn't the only company out there. There are others. From my networking and talking to other people, seems to be one of the better choices, uh, in my opinion and the opinions of others. There are some others. Um, so we'll talk about that in another video. But once, once you have the credentials, you have the background, good background, U.S. citizen, you got your CDL, it's a B license. Now, why do I only have a, I talked about buses, I'm driving a truck. It's a B license. An A license is a tractor trailer license. Tractor trailer license is exactly that. You have a tractor pulling a trailer, and when you back up a tractor trailer, you have to have some additional skills that I have as a bus driver. So a B license enables you to drive a commercial vehicle that is fixed. It's a straight truck or a bus or a, or a um, dump truck. So at Disney, we have uh, articulated buses, which in many places require an A license. But I was actually a trainer. I trained people how to drive all the buses at Disney. So not only was I a driver, after about a year, year and a half, I became a trainer and taught others how to drive buses, including the articulated buses, which in many places you need anyway. So being able to drive a large vehicle safely and having a year's experience, you're good to go. But there's some other things to talk about. So we're going to talk about the decision-making process, as I mentioned. So what about your health? Are you able to be away from home, away from your doctor for a long period of time. If you have health issues that don't allow you to drive, you got to think about that. It might not be for you. Um, many truck drivers don't have health insurance because it's a lot more expensive than be insured yourself. Uh, you don't get the, as good insurance. For example, when I left Disney, I can't get as good insurance as I had there. So, and it's a lot more expensive. Something to think about. But in expediting, as far as with uh, FedEx and with my fleet owner, they require a couple. They prefer married couples. They re and, and why is that? Because they don't want to have two people show up to be team drivers and then start fighting after a month and separate. Uh, that creates a lot of expense and it doesn't work well. So they prefer couples or married couples. You don't have to be married, but married couples is ideal. People that have been together a long time together and know what to expect from each other. If you're new in a relationship and you jump into a 40-foot truck with an 8x8 and 10x10 sleeper area, 8x8 basically, you're going to get to know each other really well. And if you're new in a new relationship, it may be so well that you're going to be saying bye-bye. So married couples or long-term couples are really what's preferred. And you have to ask yourself, are you going to be able to survive with that other person for such long periods of time? You're going to be working together, playing together, eating together, sleeping together, always together. So in my case, I've been uh, with my friend Lynn for 16, 17 years. Uh, we know each other really well. If she gets tired of me, I go to a casino. We play blackjack. We read books, so we get some time. We have some time to ourselves, do what we want to do. And that's part of it, you know, something you figure out. But if you know that's not going to work, with, you got to have a team coming in. Some companies will put you together with someone, and I usually see that doesn't work. So, so that's one of the things to consider. The financial aspect, okay, so how much are you making? How much do you need to make from this job? Um, there's a lot of tax benefits. I'm going to talk about that in another video. Per diem is how I pay myself and my driving partner out of our business account as an LLC. There's huge tax benefits to that. We're entitled to $66 per day per diem. 80% of that 
first few weeks are going to be tough. There's about a three week delay in getting payment for your runs. And once you do a run, turn it in on a Tuesday. Three, uh, that next Friday, a couple weeks from then is when you get paid. So if you do a run and turn it in on a Wednesday, you're looking at three, three and a half weeks uh, for payment. That's how it works with, our, with, with us. Um, so you've got to have some money put aside. I would recommend having a couple months worth of living money at least put aside for every business. Um, what, if, what if the truck breaks down? What if someone gets sick? What if something happens you're self-employed? Gotta have some backup plans on uh, financial. So that's something to think about. So your insurance, health insurance. Gotta have a financial reserve. Um, but what about your personality? What about how are you gonna be able to deal with making decisions out on your own, being your own boss? And when things go wrong, you gotta think outside the box. You may have equipment failures, you may have a breakdown, you may have cancellation of a run, you may be lost. Are you able to handle the stress of being on your own in a 40-foot truck out in the middle of nowhere? Um, so that, that's, a, that's another part of it. And as long as you and your driving partner, if one of you can deal with that, then, then that's, you're okay. Um, do you have a good work ethic? You, know, you have to be self-disciplined. You have to be able to do everything um, yourself. you gotta, you got to be self-motivated. you got to... If you sit back and just sit around and don't take loads, no one's making any money. Um, so these are the things to think about. Being away from home a long time, that's, that's a, a lot of people don't want that. Being in a, in a truck, you're camping in a way. You're glamping. When I cook, I have to take the cover off the stove. That's one step. Open up the vent on the ceiling. That's another step. Turn up, make sure the APU is on. I have to think a little bit more on how I'm going to cook because I have less room. I have to decide what order I'm going to do things. So it's a little different. It just takes a little more thought. Going to the bathroom, yeah, I, go to the, I got a toilet on board, I always have. Um, but then I got to clean it out every week, every five days, four to, four to seven days, I have to clean it out, dump it somewhere, find a place to do that. Um, so little things like that, you got to be able to be able to and willing to deal with. Okay, so now everything's okay. You decided, hey, this is for me. I want to see the country. I want to go out to restaurants all over the country. I want to travel. I don't mind driving. I can handle all the things that come with it, and I want to make more money than I'm making now and be in control pretty much of how much I'm making to a point. Uh, now what? Well, there's a couple options. You could buy your own truck. I don't recommend it in this beginning because you don't have the knowledge or experience unless you're already a truck driver uh, along the way. Uh, in the beginning, at least for the first year or two, I'd recommend going with a fleet owner. That's what we did. So how does that work? The fleet owner has a, a split, not exactly 50-50, but not that far off, of the revenue. So if you do a run for FedEx, and FedEx pays the fleet owner, they pay you your percentage, and then you're responsible for your, your taxes, etc. You're an independent contractor, as they say, uh, and you're responsible for everything else. Now, only you don't have any expenses regarding the truck, maintenance, washes, fuel, uh, diesel exhaust fluid, uh, any kind of tolls. All that is taken care of. So the only thing, and, and if you have to put something out for fluids like washing window washing fluid or, or oil at least with my fleet owner I mean that's all, all that's covered in reimbursement so you don't have to worry about a lot of expenses if you own a truck and you have a major repair you've got to have that money or good credit to be able to take care of that as an owner of a truck that's the risk associated with being an owner once you've done this a while and you decide you want to buy a truck you have money put aside you have a cushion to cover those things and you're good but in the beginning your best going with a fleet owner. Now, if you go with a company where they pay you per mile, you know, there's a, there's a lot of pluses and minuses. The research I did, I saw more minuses. There's a couple companies out there in Expedite that pay per mile. The amount. When I did all the math, it didn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, I did as much math as I could on it. I was, I was considering it. No, it just it didn't work. It didn't make sense. This, in my opinion, was the best way to go. But you got to do your own homework and figure it all out. Uh, so how?
how do you choose a fleet owner? Do you want to decide you want to go to FedEx? I mean, there's other companies out there, um, but if you want to go to FedEx, they don't own any of their trucks. Small fleet owners, uh, mine, for example, has, I think, 12 trucks, and they're growing. Uh, the people I talk to out there, most of them are happy with their owners. A lot of them, I'd say more are looking, hey, you know, I'm not thrilled with mine, how's yours? Um, so that's something that you got to call and talk to them, but they're, they all have little different ways of going about it. So let's say you owned a truck and you're going to turn it over to someone that you don't know, and the truck is two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand dollars, and you're going to just turn it over for someone else to drive. Okay. A lot of the fleet owners out there collect um, an escrow account, uh, like twenty five hundred dollars is a typical amount. And in case you damage the truck, in case you leave it in a bad condition, they've got that money to hold. Okay. Uh, we'll talk about pets also. Because some people bring their big pets, and their pets might eat the steering wheel and the seats. I've actually seen that. And that's quite expensive. So these seats in these trucks are a lot more involved than a car seat. Uh, expensive. So if the dog eats the whole seat, if you went out and got a shower, got upset. So they hold the money for a whole bunch of reasons. If you get in an accident, you're responsible for the damage. And that comes out of that escrow. Now, does my fleet owner collect that? No. Uh, and that was one of the things I was looking at in making that decision. Uh, and I realized now that it's not important because since they don't pay you for, for three weeks behind in the payment, they really have some of your money. So if something happens when you leave, they can keep that money, even if, you know, uh, it's in a contract, it's in an agreement. If it's your truck and you're letting someone else drive it and they damage it, and they're done and they, they leave the contract early and there's damage to the truck, you're going to want to collect something. So you're going to be able to collect whatever uh, revenue they've earned from doing runs and hold that to take care of the damages. So that's understandable. Um, so in my case, they don't collect any. I, and I know that if something happens and there's damage, they're going to withhold some of what, what's due to me for that if I leave early. In my case, it's a one-year contract. That's understandable, too. If I were to own a truck, I would want to have some type of commitment. So that's understandable. Um, some of the other things are deadhead miles I was looking at. Uh, there's one company, let's, let's say I'm trying to get home for a relative's birthday, and I have a certain day and I want to be there. And I can't get a run to my hometown, but I, I get... 400 miles away. All right, now what? I can't get a run from there to work to my home is 400 miles away. How do, do I have to buy gas? I'm like, how does it work? So different owners allow different amount of deadhead to get you home. I talked to one owner I was almost going to go with. Well, it was 200 miles. So, so if I'm, I would have to pay the difference of the other 200 miles to get home. And I could see that problem happening once in a while. Um, on the other hand, I don't want to take advantage of my owner and drive all sorts of unnecessary miles deadhead, but that's something to think about. So I was weighing, weighing okay, this one wants $2,500, he only allows 200 miles, uh, this one had no deposit required, and I was, I think, 600 miles, and I was saying, okay, that sounds more reasonable. Uh, and I'm looking around at the other trucks, most of the other trucks out there in this business for FedEx, not most of them don't have the toilets and showers and all that. And the company I'm with, which is Exam, and I'm not doing a commercial for them, it just happens to be who I'm with, um, they have, most of their trucks happen to have, they're fully equipped. They want to keep their drivers long term, they want to keep them happy and comfortable, so they are investing in very comfortable trucks. It costs money to have a truck out of service and change uh, couples or change drivers. Because uh, you're talking about two to four weeks, that truck being out and not making any runs. So that, that, that's one of the advantages of, of them doing that when they keep people on the road long. So a lot of the other fleets don't have all that fancy stuff. Um, so something to think about. So if you're a fleet owner, you know, you're doing your research, you get on social media, look at some reviews. Some of those reviews, a good company might be negative because they happen, maybe they didn't get paid, maybe 
they felt they got shipped. Or maybe, maybe they trashed the truck and didn't get their money. And so they're saying, hey, this guy didn't pay me or whatever. When I was looking at the different companies to come on board, I saw, and, um, I, I talked to another company out there. He said, yeah, the company you're looking at uh, exam, go look at social media. You're going to see some negative stuff. So I go on there. And I see, yeah, I see a negative review. Guess who wrote the negative review? It was the person who I talked to working for another company. So you got to always realize some of the negative reviews aren't really genuine or they're written for other reasons. Um, so, but it's a good idea to talk to the people that are driving. Any good company is going to give you phone numbers of people and the, 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 the drivers already with them. Talk to them. They'll be honest with you. I got positives and negatives. Uh, I got good honest feedback. I called people. I did all my due diligence I could. Uh, it took several months to make this decision. So, uh, but, and I flew with the company after a lot of comparisons. I went with a company that I felt wasn't real big. I didn't want a gigantic company because you're just a number. Uh, but they took care of me. Uh, I've had things happen where I needed someone else out there to help me. And that is the one most important thing uh, I can say is, is, is a benefit for a company I went with. support, they have three people, they have the owner and three people, and they only have 12 trucks. So that's four people and 12 trucks. That's a pretty good ratio. Uh, whenever you call, they have 24 hours, one person is not available, rolls to the next, and they take care of a problem. Middle of the night, four in the morning, doesn't matter when. Things happen at all hours. They're there for you. Um, and they've always, I don't feel any angst or anxiety about being out here all alone because I'm not. Uh, <laughs> one time I I, uh, I knew that the coolant level was like, it wasn't below the line, but I knew I was going to get someone to fill it up soon. And um, it was not below the it was okay. And before I knew it, that next day the alarm went off. And before I could even look to see what the alarm was, they called me, they had telemetry and said, so how's your truck doing? Yep. They knew exactly what was going on. You're never alone out here. And a company like that, uh, you know, they, they're taking care of things. The only negative thing I, I think I mentioned uh, on one of the postings I did was when I go for preventative maintenance or any maintenance, it takes them a long time to get everything approved. So if I'm somewhere waiting for the building of pain, sometimes it's one to two hours. I don't like that. Uh, hopefully they'll be able to change that. That's the only negative that I could find with my fleet owner. Um, not that they've not paid anything, it just it takes a while for it to get to work. So, you got to weigh all these things. Where is your, uh, does it matter where your fleet owner is located? Not really. Uh, first time you go to pick up your truck, in my case, most of the times, you're going to be where the fleet owner is, or they're going to have it moved to the training center in Ohio, where uh, FedEx is located. 
that help those who have chosen to be expediters uh, deal with different things, learn the learning curve, which we did from scratch. We're going to have videos on cooking, on coffee, on the finance of it, but we're also going to have videos showing in every one of our videos the fun that we're having, the, the scenery we're seeing. Uh, so join us for that if you're not going to do this. Enjoy seeing the country.